OK. All right. So uh, I'm Fabien uh, Benio. I'm a postdoc in robotics at uh, OIST, uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. I've been there one year. And um, last year, I published with Nicolas Rougier that uh, some of uh, you know a paper uh, in Frontiers in Neuroinformatics about how, uh, make, how to make sure that your code was scientific. And I encourage you to read it. Um, and I'm going to talk about that today. My talk is based on that. And uh, I guess my talk has a lot of overlap with what you just heard and what you, uh, with the next talk too. So I think like, uh, given the size of uh, SciPy and the interest that the subject of reproducibility seems to have, I think it's, uh, it's an important topic today. All right. So um, scientists, uh, they verify. They like to check uh, to make sure they're right. Last year, 200 of them decided to check if uh, 28 important studies in psychology were replicable. And they got 15,000 participants to help them across 36 countries. And in the end, they could replicate 14 of those experiments. 14 out of 28, half. With similar efforts, uh, getting similar results, uh, the idea that you can only replicate half of the experiment of the studies in psychology is actually becoming quite a robust and replicable result. But here we're in computer science, right? So we don't have those problems. We're dealing with computers, rational, deterministic, perfectly described machines. Well, if only that were true. It's actually precisely because we think we don't have problems, that we have problems. And I'm gonna illustrate that in many ways. So in 1987, Geoffrey Hinton was going to have to wait still 31 years to get a Turing Prize. In the meantime, he published a paper on learning and evolution. And the paper revolved around one figure. And this paper was hugely influential. It generated a lot of uh, further work, especially in biology, and now it's cited more than 1,000 times. And in uh, 2017, a young researcher, Stoshik, decided to recode the simulation of Joffrey and to rerun uh, the simulation. And he obtained this. And actually, this uh, replication was published in the journal Rescience that was co-founded by Nicolas Rouget, who is the co-author of the paper this talk is based on. And Rescience is a journal dedicated to replications of computational work. And during the submission process, you submit your paper, but also your code, and your code is reviewed along with your paper. And so Stochsik obtained similar results as Hinton, except for one big discrepancy. And, well, he thought maybe it was an outlier, right? He ran one on road simulation. Geoffrey Hinton didn't have the computational power at the time, so he just ran just one. But then he plotted all those simulation, and uh, he realized that he couldn't explain away the result of Hinton. So he contacted Hinton and asked him about it. And Hinton told him he, could, he didn't know. He didn't have the code anymore. It was 30 years ago, right? Like, so we still don't know whether a flaw in Hinton's implementation or was it just an outlier? We don't know. And that's a problem because science needs to be robust to mistakes. Science needs to, to assume that mistakes are, gonna, to, are going to be made. Mistakes are going to be made. Mistakes are made all the time. So we need practices that take that into account. And Hinton's experiment also illustrates that it's really easy, especially in computer science, to think you're doing something, but actually your computer is doing something else. You program your computer to do something, but actually because of a bug, because of a typo, because of an unforeseen dependency between two pieces of your code, well, your, code, your computer is actually computing something else, and you have no idea, and then you write this kind of paper, 
when you describe something and the result about something, but your figures and results about something else. Let me illustrate this with an actual example. Um, a while ago, I was uh, doing some replication work with an intern, and we had trouble after a few weeks on the project to actually get their result. So we asked them for the code. And after two um, the email, they responded, and they gave us the code. And in the paper, there was those two differential equations, right? Simple was a neurocomputational model. And when we got to the code, we got this. And so those two if blocks, one correspond to the first equation, and the second to the second equation. Can you see the problem? It's here. Most probably, the author copy-pasted the code and did many changes, and they did many changes right between the two pieces of code, right? Except one. They forgot to change the time constant. So they were not, in the end, they ended up publishing this paper. They talked about a model with Togaba being five milliseconds, but their results were all about Togaba being two milliseconds. And when you realize that in the original uh, paper, like Togaba was, yeah, the, the, the difference is more than twice, right? That must be, that's extremely problematic. So the idea is that your code must be available because we detected this mistake in this paper because the code was made available to us. So that's the first thing that needs to be done, availability, right? And it's simple. You have to allow people to examine your methods. Um, if you don't do that, you're doing something slightly different than science. And there is a final reason. There are many reasons, but there is another important reason for that is that it's increasingly hard to describe all the computational details of your computations. Uh, in a six-page conference paper without any appendix, describing all your, the detail of your computation is straight impossible. Did you clip those gradients? What are the value for the parameter of the Adam optimizer you're using? You're using the default value, but then which library are you using and which version? Because those default values may change. It's a lot of information. And without providing the code, you're not providing all your methods. So in practice, how should, uh, how should you do it? Well, where you should publish your code? Well, in the scientific repositories that gives you a DOI. Uh, for example, Figshare or Zenodo. GitHub is not a scientific repository. Uh, it's really useful, it's wonderful for collaboration. Do use it, and actually Zenodo integrates uh, with it a lot. But also use a scientific repository to put an archive of the code that you use to, to, to produce your experiment. GitHub code evolves. We don't want that. Um, when should you publish it? Well, I would say review time would be the best, right? Um, recently, um, at review time would be the best. The best. Um, if you're worried about people stealing your code, publishing uh, your work, publish on archive and then put your code on GitHub and you're safe. You can also publish it at publication time. In my opinion, it should be absolutely mandatory. It should be a scientific standard. Um, in any case, it must be encouraged. Uh, recently, I was, at a, I was reviewing three papers for a conference and all computational work. And none of them were providing their code and none of them were talking about publishing their code uh, at publication time. And so I asked the editors of those reviews, uh, could you contact the author and ask them for their code? And one of them agreed and contacted the author agreed too. And after a week, I had a GitHub link with the uh, code of the paper, and I was able to review it. So sometimes people don't do it just because they don't think it's useful or uh, positive, or uh, they don't advertise it, because people don't encourage them to do that. So if you're 
conference organizer or journal editor do encourage people to uh, make their code available. All right. Let's assume we have that code available. What's the problem with it? Is it scientific? So this code is a simple random walk, right? Just deciding plus or minus one at each time step. And we're going to assume that this code is correct and that it's of good enough quality. I'm not here to talk about code quality or code performance. It's not the objective of this talk is how is it how is your code useful for science? So this code, as most of you noticed, is written for Python 2. Right. Python 2 is not necessarily a good idea right now because the end of life is next year. But the problem is not is that it's Python 2, is that nowhere is it written that you should execute this code with Python 2. The, the, the ID, the first requirement for your code is that it should be rerunnable, right? So say with, with which version of the code you uh, ran uh, the, the code that produced your, your result. Here we translate it to Python 3 for the rest of this talk. But the important part here is that we uh, mentioned that we're using Python 3. So um, recently, uh, with two, two students, I was doing a replication work. And again, we had trouble replicating the, the results. So we contacted the author. And again, after the second email, they responded. And this is what we got as a response. Thank you for your interest. Uh, so the code was written 15 years ago. Um, and we think, uh, here is the NB file, so it was Mathematica. And we think we used uh, this file to generate the element of figure five. Uh, and, but the settings, the parameter settings might differ. However, when I tried to rerun the code this morning, I had some trouble because several parts seems no longer compatible with the current version of Mathematica. That's what we got. The author didn't know anymore which Mathematica they used. And we had to dig up which version of Mathematica was available 15 years ago, uh, retrieve it, install it, and uh, see if it could run the code. So the idea here is that for your code to be rerunnable, uh, you need to document how you run it. All right, so this code is rerunnable now. Uh, what's missing? Well, I guess from the previous talk, uh, you may know that uh, if you uh, run it several times, it's going to give you several different results. And that's fine, but you can't get those results back again. You can't repeat those results. So the second requirement for scientific code is that it, it should be repeatable. That's not always possible, right? Uh, there are cases when uh, your code is inherently stochastic, but in many cases, it, it is completely possible to get uh, good re repeatability. And usually just setting the random seeds. Uh, of course, setting the random seed doesn't mean that you, your results should only um, uh, be, be verified for the seed. But you know that's part of the work and repeating with different seeds to see that uh, your results are robust. But it's really important to make your code as repeatable as possible. And especially the input, uh, it should be the same all the time. Uh, even if your algorithm is stochastic, each time you're trying to generate the same result. If we go back to Hinton's experiment, even if we did have the code, uh, if the seed wasn't set, we couldn't probably uh, reproduce this result, assuming the code was correct and it was just an outlier. We never could repeat this result. OK, so the code is repeatable now. What's the problem? What do we need to do more? Well, usually when you have this code, you're going to want to use it for several figures. right? So you're gonna, let's say you have four figures in your paper, and you want just to show different one-on-one walks. You're going to use different seeds. right? And at the end, your code is going to look like this. And that means that your code is basically look, going to look like the same you know, uh, as, as a state, as a last figure you computed, last result you computed. Some of them usually 
are not even published. So when I get code from people, usually the parameter setting differ. And this is exactly what was written in this email response I got. This is the last version of the code we have. We don't know exactly what it corresponds to. And most of the time, it's really hard to get uh, the result, uh, to, to, to get the parameter settings that were used. All right. So your code is repeatable. Here, there is a, there's another problem with this code. Um, it's tested for Python 3. Uh, but actually, random choice is problematic here. Because random choice changed its behavior between uh, at, uh, with Python 3.2. There was an issue, but uh, non-uniformity. So they changed how it was programmed, and the behavior is different. So if you run this code with different version of Python, you're going to get different results. Uh, so you're not supposed to know that. Uh, those problems can be really hard to track and, and be present in any number of your dependency. What you should do is document with as many details as possible your computational context. And that, I guess that's what Dask experiment uh, does in an in, in, in a incredible fashion. So here we went much more specific. And we added a test to check that what we're doing is actually uh, the results that we expect. And as uh, the, preview, the Dask, Dask experiment uh, said, we should also get a lot of those things, like the git commit. And you should also verify that the repository is not dirty. Um, and your result should not be only your result. They should also carry information about how your results were generated. Um, and there are many libraries available to do that now. So Recipi, Sumatra, Dask Payment, that we just saw. And Reproducible, that was written by me. Uh, in many ways, Reproducible is very small and very simple. It's uh, basically the collector of Dask Payment. Uh, and you just add, uh, collect information about your computational environment. And you can add the repository, a data, uh, a file, and then you get an, all this information about how was the state of your computational environment when you ran those experiments. And you can put this file just next to your data or even inside the data file. So if we go back to Hinton's experiment again, even it was, was repeatable, had Hinton changed the seed of his, uh, uh, in the code and tried other simulation than the one that he, he published, we wouldn't be able still. We need uh, the result to carry data on how they were produced. OK. The last thing I want to talk about um, are quite simple, and I guess for your such an audience, an audience such as SciPy, it's quite uh, trivial and evident. But for, uh, in my experience, for many scientific code I get, it's not. Um, your code should be re reusable. Let me let me be clear. Once you're reproducible, you've hit the scientific standard that is really good. Um, Reusability is a bonus, and, and, but it's a great one. Um, avoid magic numbers. Avoid hard-coded numbers. Uh, so magic numbers are numbers in the code that don't have a name. So we don't know what they correspond to. Here, 10 is particularly problematic. Um, also, what I see a lot in the code I get from, from other people is that they code by comment. So, different figures uh, get, uh, you just have to comment and recommend several parts of the code in several, and you don't know. You have to look at all the code and find all those comments and make sure that everything is the right place, and usually it doesn't work that well. Um, rather than do that, just add arguments to your functions, right? And make, make your uh, intent explicit in the code. This is how I generate figure one results. This is how I generate figure five results. And then it's quite readable. Finally, and I'm saying that, but I guess you know, documentation. 
is always good, like uh, for you and for other people, uh, both like doc strings around your functions, and also if you have a specific technical choice that you made in the code, uh, adding just a comment, why you made that choice, uh, it's really good. And here I'm talking, for, for all this time I'm talking about for other people, but also for you. In six months, why you choose to use random uniform here, you don't know, you don't know anymore. It's quite specific, uh, specific reason, it's a good reason, but you'll, you'll have forgotten, you say, well, why I'm using run, uh, random uniform? I could uh, do a one know with random choice, right? And then you're gonna reproduce the result again. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is replicability. So I talked about reproducibility. Reproducibility is when you have the original code and you're able to get the same result again. Replicability in when you have the paper and you're able from scratch without looking at the, the, the original code to replicate uh, the result to get them again. Um, I've seen people produce, like providing the code and using, using the code as a crutch. Um, don't make, don't refer to the code as a parameter value table. Uh, this is this is not what the code is for. The code is here to uh, to uh, help people that want to 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 recode your experiment to make sure that all the uh, details are there. But your paper should be as clear and as detailed as possible. Here we could have said that, and. Um, you must be aware, and that what I said at the start, that it's extremely hard. Um, so here we've uh, done a good effort, and for example, we could use NumPy to implement the random walk. And the problem here is that um, between NumPy and Python, uh, they use the same uh, Mason twister generator, random generator, but the, they interpret the seeds differently. So this wouldn't work. Uh, to get exactly the same sequence. It's the same algorithm, but here uh, someone would have to look at exactly which version of the random generator, which implementation you use to get the seed uh, set properly in NumPy. It's quite possible, but you have to have this detail and uh, it's difficult, again, to talk about all the version of all the module that you used in the paper and it adds uh, so much details that usually you don't want to do that. In your paper you want to speak clearly about your ideas and algorithm. So provide the code, but uh, the code is not uh, something that replaces your paper. All right, that's the end of my talk. So you have six points. Um, we call them by R because usually there were five and they all started with R, and then now there's a sixth one. Uh, that's quite important. We thought it was evident, but it's not. So yeah, uh, make your code available. That's the absolute minimum. Like, if you don't do that, you're not doing science. You're doing advertisements. Um, make your code runnable, make your code repeatable, make your code reproducible. Once you're reproducible, you've, you, you really made the, the, the most important uh, uh, of, of, of the work that is needed, and then if you can make it reusable and replicable. Thank you. Are there questions from the audience? I have a question. Uh, yes. There's a very nice story between the last presentation, this one, and the next one, which is coming. Can you comment on... Um, the, the problem maybe some people were imagining, uh, I wrote some code in Python 1.5 mm -hmm. that uh, now somebody needs to replicate. Where do you find an executable for Python 1.5 and numeric version, whatever it was? Um, is there, uh, do you have some tools or some recommendations? How do you do the, the, didio, uh, the digital archeology span to uh, reproduce something written uh, a long time ago? Um, well, you know, uh, virtual machines are a great help there, mm. right? And um, 
I've never gone that far into Python uh, archaeology. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think like most version of Python I kept somewhere on the Python server. And uh, PyPy uh, keeps uh, all the version forever, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you're not ever allowed to modify your PyPy version. Uh, so you definitely can. Uh, many times, sometimes it's impossible, mm -hmm. right? The thing is here, it's always much harder if you don't know. Mm -hmm. If you don't know uh, that uh, it was Python 1.2.5, well, you're never going to eat that. You, uh, you're going to spend, if you really want to do it, you're going to bisect it maybe, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, yeah. So um, it might not always be possible. It might rely on hardware that is not available. Um, Hinton's paper probably used very different architecture. Uh, but if you don't know, you have no chance. Right. So it's still important to know what you don't know. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Daria. Thank you very much for the talk. It's very clear and a uh, very hot topic right now in science and reproducibility. Uh, I just wondered why you don't recommend to put your code on the GitHub, that it's very popular in, compute, in, in science uh, environment. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, I do recommend to put your code on GitHub. Um, that's very useful to collaborate with others, to report issues, to uh, get pull requests, right? And I do use GitHub for all my scientific code. What I'm saying is that GitHub might disappear tomorrow, right? It was bought by Microsoft uh, a few months back. Microsoft may decide one day to change the name. And then all your GitHub link that are in your papers, they're not valid anymore. Uh, you can also change your username. At some point, you might not like your username anymore. You change your username. All your links that are in your paper are not valid anymore. The idea that we are talking about timescales that are decades, right? Hinton's, if he had published his code on GitHub, had GitHub been available, um, maybe it would have, uh, like, GitHub wouldn't exist today anymore. So how do you make sure that in 30 years, in 15, 100, when you're dead, your code is still available? Right, and the idea there is that it's very different to make your code available for collaboration now, and you should do it, but you should also put the archive of the code that you used in a scientific repository. And the idea that you want to crystallize your code, you want to say, this is what I use. Maybe there are bugs in it, maybe uh, it won't work with the next version of Python or NumPy, but this is what I use. And then people can go look into it. Right, so it's both, you should do both. But getting a DOI and putting the link of this DOI in your paper, make, uh, it, it's to make sure that your code is still available 50 years from now, right? Okay. If the scientific property does its work. <laughs>